Next up, we're going to do the sheep brain hippocampal dissection. So this is the view that we're going to be seeing. You're going to be looking at the brain uh, from a lateral view. It'll be the left hemisphere, but everything that you see circled in green here will be removed, or at least the, the upper port parts of it will be removed. So we're going to be removing the cerebellum. We're going to be removing the cerebral cortex and the underlying white matter for the occipital lobe, the parietal lobe up here, temporal lobe, and parts of the frontal lobe, insula, and the piriform cortex as well. So all this is going to be removed. And when you take that stuff away, it looks something like this. So let's just orient ourselves here. We've got frontal lobe, olfactory bulb, optic nerve, pons, medulla. Those are things that you'll still be able to see. And here we are, part of the frontal lobe, uh, olfactory bulb, pons, medulla. I've circled in green here roughly what the, uh, the cerebral cortex would have looked like before I removed it. So this is sort of the, uh, the, the profile of the uh, the cortex that I removed. So I removed all the cortex here, here, all the underlying white matter, part of which you can see here. And I also removed the cerebellum, uh, which would have been about here. So when I first did that, I cut down through the, the occipital lobe, parietal lobe, and so forth, until I got to a ventricle, uh, a narrow gap surrounding this structure here. But this structure wasn't hanging up like this. It was sort of laying down over top of this structure here. So it would have come all the way down. But after I removed all the overlying tissue, I kind of peeled it up so that you could see this structure. The structure that I peeled up here is the hippocampus. We'll talk more about that later in the semester. You may already know that it plays an important role in certain kinds of long-term memory. So it was sort of laying over and hugging this structure just medial to it and ventral to it, which is the thalamus. So everything you see circled in blue here is the lateral surface of the thalamus. On the mid-sagittal view, we also saw the thalamus. Uh, that was the medial surface of the thalamus and the massa intermedia that crosses the midline. Here we're looking at the lateral surface of the thalamus. So the hippocampus used to encircle it. I've peeled the hippocampus up. It, hippocampus wasn't really attached to uh, the rest of the brain here, except along its, its posterior edge. So along this edge here, uh, the cortex kind of curled down and became the hippocampus in a way that the cortex is a, an extension of the hippocampus or vice versa. One kind of uh, moves into the other. So once I removed the, all the cortex, I could just peel the hippocampus up and as we'll see, it's only really connected on the medial surface as the fornix. So the left and the right hippocampus come together and meet in the middle as the fornix. Okay, let's take a look at the thalamus here. There are some structures within the thalamus that we need to learn. You might remember that the thalamus serves as kind of a relay station for all the senses except for smell. So all the senses send axons from uh, different parts of the body, from the the retina, from uh, the touch receptors in the hands, and so forth, uh, and they make a synapse. Those axons make a synapse in different parts of the thalamus with cell bodies, whose axons then relay the information up to specialized processing areas in different parts of cortex. So let's take a look at one of those areas. First, here's the optic nerve. You'll recognize that. And then that makes this the optic tract. You can't really see the optic chiasm. It's kind of on the other side, on the medial side. So the optic tract, about a million axons. Uh, these axons are coming into the thalamus, traveling toward their thalamic relay station, which is right under here, under the lateral most surface of the thalamus. So there's kind of a lateral bulge on the thalamus right about there. You follow these axons of the optic tract and they take you right there to the lateral geniculate nucleus or LGN. This is the thalamic relay for vision. So the axons from the optic tract come in, they make a synapse with the somas that make up the lateral geniculate nucleus. The axons coming off those somas come up here, become part of this white matter, carry those 
those signals back to occipital lobe, which would have been here, and that has primary visual cortex in it. Just caudal to the lateral geniculate nucleus is a little lump right here called the medial geniculate nucleus. Now you might be saying, why don't they call it anterior and posterior geniculate nucleus? In the human brain, this surface is oriented a little bit differently, such that the lateral geniculate nucleus really is more lateral to the medial geniculate nucleus. All of these structures were initially identified on the human brain, and then we uh, find analogous structures in the brains of other animals. And then underneath the very dorsalmost part of the thalamus, right under the dorsalmost bulge, right on top, is the pulvinar, or pulvinar nucleus. Next up is the superior colliculus. Again, this structure is important for generating certain kinds of eye movements. Just ventral to that is the inferior colliculus, right about there. This part here is known as the brachium, or the arm of the inferior colliculus. Inferior colliculus, part of the pathway for hearing. In fact, right under here, just ventral to the inferior colliculus, is the lateral lemniscus. This is a, a surface of white matter, uh, a white matter tract, carrying axons from brainstem nuclei, bundles of cell bodies in the brainstem, that are relaying auditory information, sound, information about the sound you're hearing. So these axons are traveling up mainly to the inferior colliculus, which then relays the information here to the medial geniculate nucleus which is the thalamic relay for hearing, and the axons from the medial geniculate nucleus send that information to the dorsal part of the temporal lobe where auditory cortex is. Here we've got the cerebellar peduncle. So this is the white matter stalk of the cerebellum. Peduncle means stalk. So this is the stalk of the cerebellum, the cerebellar peduncle. It's the white matter that I cut through to remove the cerebellum, which used to live right about here. So these are the axons carrying information up to the cerebellar cortex and from the cerebellar cortex back down into different parts of the brain and spinal cord. Over here, just to the lateral side of that, we've got the trigeminal nerve, or the stump of it. Sometimes it's not quite as visible as this, but it's generally right there dorsal and lateral to the pons, and just ventral to the cerebellum and the cerebellar peduncle. Anterior to the pons is the cerebral peduncle. So now you can see them both in the same place. They are different. The cerebral peduncle is the stalk of the cerebrum, the big anterior part of the brain. And then this is the stalk of the cerebellum, which lived right there. Next up is the horizontal dissection. So here we've uh, sliced through the brain horizontally, used a horizontal plane. First thing, let's orient ourselves. This is the anterior part of the brain. Here's the spinal cord, so this is the posterior part. You've got the cerebral cortex all folded up in and out, in and out, sulci and gyri. You've got white matter underneath it. Here we've got some white matter, a large white matter tract connecting the two cerebral hemispheres. That's the genu, that's the anterior most part of the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is the massive white matter tract that connects the gray matter in the left hemisphere with the gray matter in the right hemisphere. About 100 million axons in humans. So here's the genu of the corpus callosum. Just caudal to that, you'll find the fornix. And caudal to that, you'll find the thalamus. I'd encourage you to take a look at the mid-sagittal section again and find the genu on your mid-sagittal section and draw an imaginary line horizontal back posteriorly from the genu on that mid-sagittal section and see what structures intersect that line. You'll find the fornix, 
is the next structure caudal or posterior to the genu. The thalamus is caudal to that. The pineal, caudal to that. And then the superior colliculus, just caudal to that. Now that we've cut through the thalamus, you can actually see the gray matter inside of it. So this right here and right here is the lateral most bulge of the thalamus. So this is the lateral geniculate nucleus that we saw on the last view. And now that you've, we've cut through it, you can see that it is a nucleus. It's a chunk of gray matter. So the axons coming from the LGN here become this white matter. This white matter consists mainly of axons from the LGN carrying signals back to primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. If you remember, surrounding the thalamus on that um, hippocampal dissection was the hippocampus itself, kind of encircled it. The left and the right hippocampus kind of come over top of the thalamus and become the fornix. So on either side, the hippocampus on either side of the brain comes around and becomes the fornix. The left and the right hippocampus meet in the middle as the fornix. So here's the hippocampus on the left and on the right. And now you can sort of see that the hippocampus is surrounded by ventricle, except right here on this medial edge uh, where it becomes continuous with the rest of cortex. Here's the cerebellar peduncle, which we've seen already. White matter stalk connecting the cerebellum. Now we're going to see the basal ganglia over here and here. The basal ganglia are a set of deep uh, gray matter structures in the brain. They're also sometimes called the basal nuclei. Here's the caudate or caudate nucleus. This is really just the head of the caudate. It's a, a pretty large structure with a long tail that extends kind of dorsally and posteriorly. And again, everything in the brain is bilateral, so here's the other one right here. Just lateral to the, uh, to the caudate nucleus is some white matter, some wispy kind of white matter. And then you've got some more gray matter here. That next chunk of gray matter contains both the putamen and the globus pallidus. These are distinct structures, but they're difficult to discriminate uh, on this view and without staining the brain. But just know that they're both in there. So uh, know that this structure here, this chunk of gray matter, contains both the putamen and the globus pallidus. Just lateral to that is this crisp, white, almost straight line. This is a very useful landmark. It's called the, uh, the lateral lemniscus. You don't need to remember that, but uh, this crisp white line is uh, a useful landmark because just medial to it is the putamen and globus pallidus, and just lateral to it is the claustrum, another thin strip of gray matter. The caudate, the putamen and globus pallidus, and the claustrum then are the structures that make up the basal ganglia. And then, just lateral to the claustrum is another th very thin strip of white matter, sometimes barely visible, which separates the claustrum from the cortex. This chunk of cortex is the insula, which we saw in the lateral view. Again, I encourage you to sort of flip back and forth between views, trying to create a three-dimensional uh, map in your head of where these structures are. Right here is the sylvian fissure, which we've seen. And now you can see that the insula extends into it. In fact, on the other side of the brain here, on the left side, I know it looks asymmetrical, but the brain itself isn't that asymmetrical. What is asymmetrical is my cut. On the left side here, this cut, this plane, is probably about a millimeter, maybe almost two millimeters dorsal to the, the plane where I cut it over here, just sort of the, the knife drifted dorsally as I cut through, such that you can still see 
the uh, the sylvian fissure right here but now you can't see the insula it's sort of just ventral to where we're looking or at least you can't see the part of the insula that's visible on the lateral surface but this right here is still part of the insula so the insula seen here extends dorsally but as it moves dorsally it becomes completely covered up by the frontal lobe and by the temporal lobe just as it is in the human brain so in the human brain you can't see any of the insula from the lateral surface because it's completely covered up by the frontal lobe and by the temporal lobe and here it is so this is the insula in the human brain right there and right there and you can see this is the frontal lobe what's called the frontal operculum kind of hanging over top of the the insula and then part of the temporal lobe covering it up completely some other structures we've seen cerebral cortex first notice how much cortex we have relative to the sheep just a massive surface area all folded up Underneath you've got the white matter, including this, the corpus callosum. This is the genu of the corpus callosum. Here we've got the, uh, the fornix again. We've got the lateral ventricles here. And just lateral to those are the caudate, the putamen and globus pallidus. And then this really thin wisp of gray matter is going to be the claustrum. And then, of course, the insula. Here we see the thalamus. Uh, as you go posteriorly, things look a little bit different. Again, our cerebellum and our brain stem is oriented ventrally instead of posteriorly as it is in the sheep. In fact, here you can see just the very dorsalmost tip of the cerebellum sticking up there. And you can see the cerebral cortex on there. I'm sorry, the cerebellar cortex.